All things theology, all things theology. We chop it up properly without an apology. Gotta get that theology to God, hallowed be. Cause this is how we do it at All Things Theology. What is going on, everybody? Grace and peace. Good to be back with you all. Welcome to another episode of All Things Theology. It's your host, K-Dub, and it seems like I got to I gotta do a little... By the way, hold on. Before we get to that, if you, you, you're liking this shirt, go to kdubtrue.com. Get you an All Things Theology shirt. Support the ministry. Go stream the album, kdubtrue.com. Links in the description below. We're trying to do things big around here, right? <laughs> I want to tell you guys a crazy story. I, I, I kind of want to start off the podcast, like giving kind of some story or et cetera, right? Man, Friday, Friday, y'all, I was heading to work. You know, you know how like when you subconsciously drive, you, you, you're paying attention, but you take that road every day. It's a familiar road, right? It's a very familiar road to me. I take it all, take it every day, Right. And so I'm driving along and then boom, I see three cars just crash. I've never witnessed a car crash like this ever in my life, right? Just, I, I want to say, I would say amazing, but that's not even the accurate word. It was, it was insane. It was uh, just bizarre, right? So I see three cars, right? They're crashed out. So, I mean, I'm like, I got to go see what's. If they're okay, it, it, it was that bad to where I was like, I got to see what happened. I got to see what happened. So I go and check on the first truck. He's fine. He's like cutting himself out of the airbag. I'm like, you're good, bro. Right? I go to the next person. It's an older lady. And she's like, ah, oh, my shoulder, my shoulder. So I'm, I, I got it. I help her out, right? I help her out, right? She's fine for the most part. Her shoulder's hurting, but she's fine. I go to the next car. Guys. The car is on fire. I kid you not. The car, the hood, like the engine is on fire. Right? And the, some guy tried to help help them out. And they're like, they're like, the door's locked. I can't get it out. And so I'm like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? There's people inside, right? But they opened the door. I was like, okay, great, great. I'm like telling the girl. It's a, it's, it was a uh, teenage girl. Teenage girl. I'm like, Get out of the car. Get out of the car. Like, I kind of don't want to get too close because the car's on fire. Could you blame me? Right? But then she's like, I can't move. I'm like, oh my goodness. I got to go in there. Right? This is like some movie stuff I'm telling you guys, right? And so I'm like, okay, I got I to get her. She's bleeding all over. I grab her. I got blood all over me. Guys, this was... <laughs> I had. I would... I would understand why you don't believe this story it's, it sounds like a movie right i'm helping her out right i'm helping her i get her kind of far away from the car and i'm like okay you are you okay she's like yeah what about my friend i'm like you, your friend what do you what do you mean your friend so we long story short we help our friend out of there they get air flighted out it was it was crazy it was crazy Guys, that was that was like bizarre, the most bizarre situation I've ever been in a way. Been in. Speaking of car crashes, we're going to talk about Mike Todd, right? <laughs> I had to set that one up. Although that was a true story. I was like, you know, I'm going to make that transition. Hope you like that one. Speaking of car crashes and car wrecks, Mike Todd. Someone sent me this video. Matter of fact, I say someone. I had saw it. I put it in my watch later. I had like five people send me this video. What are your thoughts? What do you think? So I gave it a I gave it a listen. Uh, shout out to the honest youth pastor. Shout out to the honest youth pastor. Uh, I thought this video was very well researched. Um, I thought it was very well uh, produced and done. So hey, honest youth pastor, shout out to you, man. Uh, very good video. Very uh, well researched. Uh, the history and everything like this. So we're going to take a look into the history of Mike Todd and Transformation Church. I think for many of you guys, uh, from what I've done, if you follow this channel for any length of time, some of this will be familiar, but some of it will be new. And I think it will be helpful as we, you know, I play some of this and I talk about it and, and just to share um, 
just some of the background of Mike Todd. You know, everyone has a tradition of where they come from, even if you do not, even if you don't know it, right? Um, but I, it's good to know your traditions, right? The line of thinking you come from influences and everything. That way you can better challenge them, right? Um, but we're going to see the legacy, or not even the legacy, the, the background and history of Mike Todd is very problematic because of the people who's uh, <clears throat> influenced him, right? The tradition he comes out of. You guys are going to see that very clearly. Um, and so, guys, I, I mean, I've been talking long enough. Let's Let's actually get into this video and i went from the sound man to the lead pastor of the church in four years now it's a way longer story than that if you're anywhere within the christian space you've likely heard of a pastor named mike todd he leads transformation church and when you think of mike todd or transformation church what do you think of well, for me, I think of Mike Todd's dynamic speaking. I think of his problematic sermons. I think of his leadership. I think of his theology. But I also think about how Transformation Church and Mike Todd were skyrocketed into celebrity status. But how did he get there? Now, the more I saw of him, the more videos I saw about him, and the more sermons I reviewed of him, the more these questions just kept coming up. Why does he structure his sermons the way that he does? Who taught him to preach? What stream of theology is behind his interpretation? Now, this, these are going to be two questions that I'm familiar or uh, that I was curious with. Right? Uh, who influenced him and what, what was his uh, stream of theology? Right? What, what's his background? Right. Where does um, he come from? Right. And I think you guys are going to be interested if you don't know. Right. If you haven't already watched this or if you haven't uh, listened to uh, uh, maybe some of my uh, uh, lives, you're going to be interested to see this. Yeah. Someone says this is documentary <laughs> next Netflix level. He did very good. Uh, shout out to Honest Youth Pastor. He did very good with this. Um yeah, yeah. And, and matter of fact, near the end of this, I did get a shout out. I see Dear World Christian's already seen this <laughs> or I, my video was on the screen. And matter of fact, I'm supposed to be doing an interview with with him and some other people maybe next week. And so who knows? I may upload that on my channel as well. So if you guys would be curious in, in uh, seeing that, but let's continue. And how did Transformation Church even become Transformation Church in the first place? Well, because I'm curious and because my curiosity led me down a rabbit hole, I want to share with you what I found. So even though Michael Todd took over as lead pastor of Transformation Church in February of 2015, to get to the bottom of all of these questions, we actually have to go back nearly 50 years in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Not just to the creation of Transformation Church, not just to the founding of Transformation Church, not even to... Now, if you look there, there's... Um... Um, Macintosh, uh, both of the Macintoshes, and the Monroes, um, Miles Monroe and his wife. And so we're going to see why that's important a little bit later. So we'll continue. His parents, but all the way back to a university that's in Tulsa, Oklahoma, only six miles north of Transformation Church's current location. That university is Oral Roberts University. Now, I pause here to say this. If you do not know anything about Oral Roberts University, you've probably been sleeping under a rock <laughs> or you're just not familiar, which I totally understand that. Let me share. So let me just say this about Oral Roberts University. Oral Roberts University is the. <laughs> how do I say this nicely? Uh, probably can't say it nicely, but it is the it is like heretic university. What do I mean by that? Who are some famous people that have come out of or Roberts University? Well, um, Joel Osteen, right? Miles Monroe, Kenneth Copeland, Coulter Pearson, Ted Haggard, uh, jo John, uh, John Osteen, which is uh, Joel Osteen's father. I'm not saying he's a heretic. I don't really know much about his theology, but it is the who's who when it comes to false teaching. And so... I don't find it ironic. I don't find it ironic that that's some of his background. So 
Uh, yeah, or or Roberts. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, Chris and Christ says, yeah, it's, this is Word of Faith University, right? Uh, Carrie Job even went there, right? So yeah, um, who the who's who is a false teaching? To understand Oral Roberts University, you have to understand the man that was Oral Roberts. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my happy privilege and pleasure to present the man that God has raised up with a message for your deliverance. God's man for this hour, the Reverend Oral Roberts. You see, he was born in 1918 in Oklahoma, and he began his ministry as an evangelist within Pentecostalism in the late 1940s. He became well known for his healing crusades, which drew large crowds and involved the laying on hands and praying for miraculous healings. He did this all the way up into the 1950s and through the 1950s, and he launched his own radio and television programs because of the success of his tent evangelism. This further... So Oral Roberts can be credited with the popularization of uh, TV evangelism. Not saying that he was the first one to do it, but definitely that's how Oral Roberts got big and a lot of TV evangelism became popular. And I would argue word of faith doctrine became popular was through Oral Roberts, um, through Tulsa. Um, uh, man, there's, there's so much bad teaching that has come through Tulsa. Like that is literally the streamline, the river of where a lot of the word of faith theology originated and spread from. Right. It's, it's, it's the it's the heart of word of faith theology. Tulsa expanded his reach and his influence. Oral Roberts believed in what he called a holistic approach to healing and education. This concept emphasized the importance of addressing the spiritual, physical, and emotional needs of the individuals in order to achieve wholeness and well-being. He also believed in the power of faith and prayer to bring about miraculous healings, and he often prayed for these miraculous healings, and apparently, according to some accounts, those happened at his tent revivals. To best understand Oral Roberts University, one must understand that it is a private Christian university founded on the beliefs and teachings of Oral Roberts himself and his Pentecostal theology. This means that the focus is on faith and healing and blessing and spiritual development. Yeah, and we see a lot of the origin. I mean, just look at the uh, people who graduated from Oral Roberts. I mean, look at Kenneth Copeland for a lot of these what I'm going to absolutely call charlatans, faith is something that you have to tap into to uh, achieve, you know, some grand thing, you know, your desires, a blessing, a miracle, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so um, I would fundamentally disagree with a lot of their definition of faith. Faith is a trust. Um, faith is a trust and the object of faith is always Christ, not to get what you want. See, in word of faith theology, uh, Christ becomes a means to get what you want. So if you want blessing, well, you got to trust in Christ to get that blessing, right? If you want the new house, well, you got to trust in Christ. to See, see, Christ isn't the end in word of faith uh, or Roberts University theology, which is the, that's the sad part. I, that's why I say I fundamentally disagree with how the word of faith people define faith. Christ is the object. He's the end, right? Like, like that, that, that's enough for us, right? And so, yeah, uh, we'll continue. The one important thing to realize is that even though Ordell Roberts did not create the prosperity gospel, he gave it a bullhorn with right. the platform that he had. So he didn't create word of faith theology, um, Justin Peters has done a great job on um, um, going through the Word of Faith history. I highly suggest that. Um, and maybe I'll have Justin, maybe I'll ask Justin Peters to come on. Uh, let, let me know in the chat if you like that. But again, as was just stated, he popularized Word of Faith theology. Without Oral Roberts, uh, who knows where Word of Faith theology would be? Uh, just a church history thing that ended right but now hey it's still around we see the effects today but we'll continue out of oral roberts university has come the likes 
of Joe Olstein, John Hagee, Ron Carpenter Jr., Mike Bickle, Joyce Myers, and connected to Oral Roberts University in one way or another are other teachers such as T.D. Jakes and Kenneth Copeland. In addition to these very well-known names, but you, you see that, uh, look, look at all the, the breadcrumbs of people who come out of Tulsa. They don't produce sound doctrine. Why? Because the theology of Oral Roberts, right? The theology of Oral Roberts is problematic. And so you're not going to get sound doctrine from people who come out of uh, Oral Roberts because <laughs> Oral Roberts himself was a false teacher. And if you believe what Oral Roberts taught, right, if you believe what's taught at Oral Roberts University, then that's why, I mean, look at all the list of people, right? There's no sound theologian out of that movement. Um, so, yeah. And, and, and yeah, as, as stated in the chat, a lot of this has come comes from the Christian science movement. Yeah, I, I got to have Justin Peters on, man. I, I, I got to do it, man. I got to get I got to get them on, man. I got to get Justin Peters on. All right, let's continue. That came out of Oral Roberts University comes three individuals that will unknowingly play a pivotal role in the foundational theology that will be Transformation Church and its pastor, Mike Todd. For the purpose of making this overview as understandable as possible, let's start with the man that had no direct hand in forming Transformation Church, but indirectly put all the people in place that would have a hand in it. And his name was Carlton Pearson. Carlton Pearson has two degrees from Oral Roberts University. Now, uh, this is going to be stated, but who is Carlton Pearson? Carlton Pearson was literally the prodigy of Oral Roberts himself. Um, and we're going to see how pro pro problematic a or or Carlton Pearson is. Uh, a good a good pretty summary of, if you just want, like to watch something, I think it's on Netflix or Hulu or whatever. I think it's called Come Sunday. It kind of gets into a lot of Carlton Pearson. I've reviewed uh, some of Carlton Pearson's uh, theology on this channel. Carlton Pearson is a universalist. He's a classical liberal. Uh, he doesn't believe any of the Bible, <laughs> uh, in, in any uh, orthodox sense, right? It's not the word of God. Um, he doesn't believe in heaven or hell. We are all God. So he, so in that way, he doesn't have a, a good theology of uh, theology proper. Um, he doesn't believe Jesus is God, not in any historic, uh, orthodox, biblical sense, right? And so, um, Carlton Pearson uh, is is a is a uh, sore spot for Oral Roberts, but he's a, just a sore spot in general, right? But this is the influence, and I'm going to show you why it's even more problematic, right? I'm going to show you why it's more problematic about Carlton Pearson's connection with the Todds. The first, a BA in Biblical Literature, which he received in 1973, and a Master's in Theology that he received in 1976. Now, both of these are impressive, I suppose, but one of the things that you really need to know about Carlton Pearson is that he was the personal mentee of Oral Roberts himself. What Carlton did not say when I shared with him in 1973 was that I felt in the innermost part of my being that the next great move of the Holy Spirit would be among black people. And the next great revival would be among, would be initiated by black people. And that he was going to have a leading part in it. You know, when I first saw this, I was kind of joking to myself. Maybe he was thinking about BLM, but obviously <laughs> that wouldn't fit. But very curious. But, but listen to this. And after graduation, Pearson becomes an evangelist and a revivalist and travels all over the country. And while traveling, Pearson meets Tommy and Brenda Todd at a prophetic conference put on by Charles Green in Shreveport, Alabama. Now while at this conference, he hires the Todds and brings them back to Tulsa, Oklahoma to help him found a church named Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center in 1981. So that, that's important. That's important. Right. Because we've 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 done uh, sermon reviews where we can obviously that Todd, he's quoting Miles Monroe. Right. He's wearing the T-shirt. He's very familiar with Todd. Uh, sorry, Miles Monroe's theology. But here we even see that uh, Mike Todd's parents did ministry and work together at a church. Right. 
So so just to show you the connection and what I what I've been saying and, and, and talking about, you know, for for a couple of months, especially since the kingdom series. The Todd's are freshly married and they are living in the apartment above Pearson's mom's garage. At the same time that Pearson has talked to the Todd's about helping him form Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center, he also taps another Oral Roberts graduate, Gary McIntosh, and his wife Debbie to come and help found the church as well. Now, while at the church, Pearson makes the Azusa Conference, founded out of Oral Roberts University, but led by him and appoints Gary McIntosh as the bishop of that conference and basically lets Gary McIntosh run the conference. Now the conference's name, Azusa, comes from the name that came from the Azusa Street Revivals of the early Pentecostal charismatic movement. Yeah, and if you haven't studied up on the uh, Azusa Street Revivals, they were, I mean, it was a Pentecostal movement. Uh, some of these people here deny the Trinity, but it, just this um, quote unquote revivalistic movement which, I mean, if you actually study some of the stuff, it was a lot of what you see in Bethel. I mean, that's that was normative on a Azusa Street rival. But but again, we see we see the main players, right? Uh, the Todd's Michael Todd's parents, um, uh, Miles Monroe, but also McIntosh, Pastor Mac, quote unquote, Pastor McIntosh. Right. But all these people played a role, one in the direct influence of Mike Todd, but also transformation church now before we go any further it's important to get to know gary mcintosh a bit more because he plays a huge role a foundational role in the formation of transformation church and mike todd's ministry let's back up just a little bit as i stated gary mcintosh is a graduate of oral roberts university he graduates in 1975 though we have no idea what his degree is actually in after graduating, Gary McIntosh stays at Oral Roberts University and becomes the associate chaplain for three years. After a short stint in that role. So it's like, what's the common denominator between all these people? It's like Oral Roberts and his bad theology. Just very interesting. Gary and his wife, Debbie, both become part of the staff of a local Christian school by the name of Bethany Christian School. This is also located in Tulsa. It was after Gary and Debbie left Bethany Christian School that they've joined up with Carlton Pearson and others, such as the Todd's, to form Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center. This is founded in 1981. Now, Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center becomes one of the fastest growing churches in its day in Tulsa, Oklahoma, averaging four to 5,000 people weekly, having a huge radio and television presence. In fact, Carlton Pearson is almost copy paste of his mentor, Oral Roberts. This is along with all the crowds that the Azusa Conference brings. And this makes Carlton Pearson a household name in the Pentecostal movement in the 80s and 90s. In fact, many well-known- I mean, Carlton Pearson was was the, I mean, he was the, the name, household name of TBN and Oral Roberts back in the 80s and the 90s, if you're not familiar with him. Just to, le just to let you know, um, um, just the kind of level of popularity he had. I mean, I think he would have blew Mike Todd away as far as popularity that he had at that time. I think a bigger name than Jake's. Now, obviously, we don't affirm any of these people, but just to kind of compare, give you some kind of comparative uh, popularity that um, that he had at that time. Pentecostal and charismatic pastors that we know today have preached from the stage of the Azusa Conference or the Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center. One such individual, another Oral Roberts graduate, Dr. Miles Monroe, did so himself. Monroe would later become the overseers of the church that Tommy and Brenda Todd would start, but we'll talk more about that later. Though I can't say for certain, it seems that Dr. Miles Monroe had a huge impact on Tommy and Brenda Todd, but additionally, he had an impact on a young Michael Todd. So much so that Mike Todd wore a shirt with Dr. Miles Monroe's face on it while preaching through the Kingdom series. Now, if you guys remember this, this was a <laughs> this was a bad sermon, right? This was the God can't do anything unless you let him, right? Uh, sermon. Um, so much bad theology came out of this sermon, right? If you like to look at it, go go look at it. Um, sermon review, the Kingdom. Um, I think this might have been part one or part two. I can't remember, but this was this was a really bad sermon, and anybody watching that will 
very see that right D- didn't he do something with the chick-fil-a sauce and <laughs> he licked the chick it was this was so bad this was some bad stuff but uh we will continue in addition to dr miles monroe preaching from the stage of the azusa conference you have the likes of joyce myers td jakes benny hinn paul morton paul crooch jim baker all sharing the stage of azusa conference these are the type of people that pearson brought to his ministry however Carlton Pearson's ministry started to fall apart as he began to preach what was known as the gospel of inclusion. His blood covers, whether you like it or not. His blood covers your sin, whether you accept it or not. God loves you, whether you know it or accept it or not. Back in the- So, yeah, Carlton Pearson got in a heap of um, trouble by preaching things like universalism, um, annihilationism, meaning... Uh, his form of that, which, you know, there is no hell Um, and much more. But just check that out. 90s, the bishop was a successful Pentecostal minister of a megachurch in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He held popular revivals across the country, counseled presidents and on and on. But he lost it all when he says he received a direct message from God that went against the teachings of the Pentecostal church. And that message was that. Let let me say this, because what we're going to actually see from here on is this common theme of getting revelations outside for, out, uh, outside of Scripture from God. Mike Todd is huge on this, huge on this. And, and, and where do you think he got it from? Uh, probably his tradition of people he was listening to and learning from, right? My friends, at the end of the day, it all goes back to and stems to, did God really say? And this is what he's questioning, right? Carton Pearson. Yeah, Robert uh, Carton is still pastoring in California, even though much of the Bible he doesn't believe. Isn't that funny? Now, um, Carton Pearson still is, uh, you know, re- connected to Transformation Church. I, th- I think I saw not too long ago they were having a picture and um, Mike Todd, they were, you know, pretty much saying he looked up to uh, Carton Pearson. I-, I-, I don't mind them being friends, right? I mean, obviously can still evangelize to them but is, do we think that's actually happening that he, carton person is being called to repentance by mike todd when he barely mentions the subject of repentance i highly doubt it but nevertheless um if someone whose this theology is so bad so bad yet he still is allowed to partner with your church and you, you know he he's a great theological influence with you that that's problematic in of itself but we'll continue There is no hell, that people who aren't, quote, saved are not going to hell, that in fact we have a loving and forgiving God. First, I thought there there would, I believed in hell, I just didn't believe anybody would be in it because of the finished work of the cross. Uh, Then I started thinking about the absurdity and the vulgarity of eternal torture. It just didn't, I couldn't reconcile that with them. And I'm not going to get into here, but if you would like uh, me to show the actual lunacy of his position um <laughs> i just saw a comment that made me laugh if you i i actually reviewed him talking about this right he he finds hell disgusting and uh, all this kind of stuff and torturing right uh i i reviewed it and showed how he's actually one of the things he's mischaracterizing the christian position but um his view of no hell is actually problematic when you think about a divine justice perspective that, you know, there will be many people who will get away with uh, untold, untold injustices uh, for, for infinite, right, for, forever. That's actually problematic, more problematic than God displaying his wrath on deserving sinners. But again, go check the Cotton Prison video if you'd like to see that. All character of a God of love. So you come out and you say that to your congregation, 6,000 people, and it did not go over well. The gospel of inclusion being that he denied the reality of hell and started to embrace teachings of universalism. The result of this is that by 2006, he had lost Higher Dimensions Church and had been disfellowshipped from his denomination. But let's... Yeah, uh, so that that is true. But but from from what I recall, he still partners with them. Some of those guys even invite him into the church still. So, I mean, you just lost your, your church and your status. Well, I mean, cool, but... He still, a lot of these guys still partner with them, which is insane. Back up before that. There's a ton that happens before that. 
See, Gary and Debbie McIntosh leave Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center around 98, 99. And they go out and Gary becomes an itinerant preacher. He goes and preaches at events and Debbie stays at home. Now the story here of the founding of Greenwood Christian Center is incredibly interesting. Check this and out. And it is foundational to Transformation Church and Mike Todd's story. Check out how Greenwood Church was uh, founded. Greenwood, Greenwood Church, I believe that's the, uh, was the church before Transformation Church, right? So, th so that they just renamed it after that. So check it out. You see, Gary and Debbie McIntosh start Greenwood Christian Center in 1999. But before they do this, they say that the Spirit told them to do so. What do we see again? God speaking to them outside of Scripture, right? To start a church. I'm going to see a common theme in this. And I called a friend of mine who was a prophet. And so we'd meet every morning and we'd get the Tulsa newspaper and we would just pray the front page of the paper. So we're just praying up a storm. Yeah. The Lord. <laughs> That's funny. Not, not scripture, but they're reading the paper. I, I just think that's funny because some eschatologies uh, get made fun of about um, <laughs> getting their eschatology from newspapers. They, they're getting their prop, their prophetic word. In, anyways, I, I find that funny. <laughs> Said the second thing, and that was about starting the church. I had just come out of years and years of starting a church and pastoring. Yeah. I was traveling on the road and having great success and enjoying it. Yeah. She said, I think I have a word from the Lord. Yeah. And she told me and I said, where did he say? Debbie, one day while driving to Dallas, says she hears the spirit tell her that her and Gary need to start a church in North Tulsa. Gary says that he wasn't on board at first and he's sort of dragged along, but he does say during one of his prayer drives to sort of seek out what the spirit wanted him to do. He was driving through North Tulsa and the spirit speaks to him tells him to get out on the corner of Archer and Greenwood, and on that corner, while Gary is praying, he claims the Spirit told him, reverse the curse. Now, when I first heard that, I thought that was an odd phrase. That the, that the Spirit of God, that God told him, while he's driving his car, tells him to stop. I, I hope the Spirit told him to get out of the way of traffic. <laughs> you know, no one caused an accident in Tulsa. It's kind of rough out there. But nevertheless, tells him to stop on Archer and Greenwood, right? And tells him, tells him to reverse the curse. Very interesting because I thought that's what Christ did. I thought Christ reversed the curse, right? Are we, are we talking about some other curse? I mean, what, what is the curse you're going to be reversing? Sin? Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, great question. Uh, great question. Who's cursed? Black folk? Great question. <laughs> I thought the I, this even gets to, into their theology is problematic, right? Very problematic. Later, Gary researches what happened at that corner, and it was the race riots of 1921 that had started right there. Now, this video is not about the race riots in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921, but I would recommend that you look it up and be informed about it. Because the foundation of Transformation Church, which had been previously called Greenwood Christian Church, is built on the idea that Gary and Debbie are to go to North Tulsa, plant a church, and quote, reverse the curse. Gary and Debbie do just that. They start Greenwood Christian Center in a house in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1999. They eventually would end up at the exact same location that Transformation Church would be in until 2019 when they bought the Spirit Bank Center. But again, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Now, while Gary and Debbie are planting Greenwood Christian Church, Tommy and Brenda Todd are still at Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center. In fact, they stay there and form a parachurch organization called Gap Standards. Gap Standards is basically an organization in which they will come to your church and teach you how to pray prophetically. Brenda Lee they teach us how to pray prophetically <laughs> as if prophecy can be uh, something you teach someone to do. Where is that in the Bible? I don't I don't see a teaching a, a prophetic class being done in the Bible. Very interesting. But funny enough, I, I just happened to click on this Sunday. Um Mike Todd, and, and they were doing their uh, little praise and worship thing, and 
um, he stopped it and was like, uh, Mike Todd, that is, um, you know, started speaking. He started speaking about gap standards. And I was like, hmm, okay, I didn't know what he's talking about. So it's very funny, very funny now that we're seeing this. This is gap standards. Um, so very interesting, right? And, and yeah, Patrick Hill, you're making a good point that we've constantly said one of the critiques we made is this is very Mormon theology, a lot of their stuff. Right. But anyways, but in a lot of this theology, you can always tell someone if they hold to the word of God as sufficient when they ignore the Bible for this quote unquote word of God. You know how many cults have started because of this word of God they heard from the Lord? So many cults. <laughs> uh, Mormonism started because a guy heard in the woods uh, the voice of God speaking. But guess what? It contradicted the word of God. And what does the Bible say about the word of God? It is actually the, the more sure word. So keep your little voice in your head. I'll go with the more sure word every time. I don't need your, your you know, your quote unquote word of God. I have the word of God. A ton of this and for the small price of 200 plus dollars they can teach you that same thing too oh yeah 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 for for, for 200 plus bucks we'll teach you how to pro prophesy <laughs> we'll teach you how to make up stuff too <laughs> and that parachurch organization is started while they're at higher dimensions evangelical center they actually stay there until 2003 and it's unclear why they leave. It could very well have to do with the direction that Carlton Pearson was going with his theology. The reason I doubt that is because in a Twitter post from 2018, Mike Todd includes Bishop Carlton Pearson as a pastor he looks up to and appreciates during Pastor Appreciation Month. So notice 2018, he put up a post and Carlton Pearson, the guy who de denies hell, universalist, believes everybody's going to heaven. Is someone Mike Todd appreciates as his theological influence. Very interesting, huh? And you can see down in the corner, that's Robert Morris. Uh, Macintosh is right there. Hold on, let me see if we can zoom out and see some more people. Um, oh, man, I, I might have messed that up. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, right, right. Hold on, let's, let's see if we can get back to that. Hold on, let me play it. ...is started while they're at Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center. They actually stay there until 2003, and it's unclear why they leave. It could very well have to do with the direction that Carlton Pearson was going with his theology. The reason I doubt that is because in a Twitter post from 2018, Mike Todd in Yeah, so I can't I can't make out these others. Just this, uh, but you can see it's uh, his mom and dad is on there. Macintosh. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, yeah. Yeah, but definitely Carlton Pearson is on there as well. So it's very interesting, his theological influences. It's, it's, his theological influences is a guy, is a guy that literally to this day denies hell. Denies hell. Uh, is a universalist. Uh, doesn't believe the Bible is the word of God. So much more nonsense. Includes Bishop Carlton Pearson as a pastor he looks up to and appreciates during Pastor Appreciation Month. Despite the fact that Carlson Pearson had been declared a heretic by his denomination long before that. What I think probably happened is that the Todds wanted to get out on their own and they wanted to make sure they could grow gap standards. So they go out in 2003 and do just that. From 2003 until 2008, they pursue this idea of growing gap standards international. They're preaching itinerantly every Sunday at a different church, preaching about prayer and building the body. But in 2008, they form a church also in Tulsa called Spirit and Truth Praise and Worship Center. Mike Todd has said he thought this was the dumbest thing they could ever do. <laughs> they, in 2008, they started a church. And I told them, this is the dumbest thing you could ever do. Like, <laughs> y'all are 50 something years old starting a church. Like, and you can't even start on Sunday mornings. You're gonna have to do on Sunday night because they're full-time itinerant ministers. And so they were usually preaching somewhere on Sunday mornings and then would fly back so they could preach to their church on Sunday night. I was like, this is dumb, don't do it. They were in their 50s. They were traveling for gap standards. Why would they want to plant a church? In fact, Mike Todd was so against this, he doesn't even attend the church for the first eight months. But that doesn't mean he wasn't attending a church. He'd actually already been helping out 
at Greenwood Christian Center, led by Gary and Debbie McIntosh. Mike Todd ran the soundboard for them. Now, I don't know what it is about people in production that, that get pastoral jobs are always like heretics. <laughs> you know, Joel Osteen was the cameraman at first, you know, and so it's like, what is it with getting people from the sound? Stay in your sound team, right? Stay in the sound team. We need you there. <laughs> but no, obviously, it's actually worse, much worse. It's, you know, his theology, right? But but we're actually going to see um, the theology or how Mike Todd started to first get into um, preaching and teaching, et cetera, if, if we want to even call it that, right? <laughs> so let's get into it. Two things happen during this time that drastically affect Mike Todd personally. Mike eventually decides that he would go help his mom and dad at their church because they were in desperate need of musicians, and he knew that. Now, after being there for a month helping them, he says his mother came up to him with a prophetic word that he was supposed to lead the youth. So I started going to Sunday nights to help them with the music. Maybe four weeks after I started helping them with the music, my mom comes to me in this deep prophetic kind of tone, and she's like, God told me. You're supposed to do something with the youth. I said, you have four other sons. <laughs> like, so his mom got this prophetic word. Um... Yeah, this prophetic word to that he was supposed to run the sound. Oh, sorry, run the uh, youth program. And clearly he was not on board with it initially. Right. But it gets worse. Let's keep checking it out. And, and you only have seven people in your church. Why would you why would I be doing anything with the youth? She said, God said you're supposed to do something with the youth. He said at first he just sort of brushed it off, didn't care. But after a month, he agreed that he would do it. But he does acknowledge that he never studied to teach. And when he went in there, basically, he just told the kids stories that he remembered from his heart. Now, listen to this, because we're if, if you watch this channel, we're actually not surprised by any of this. And I had never studied. I had never preached a message. I would never been in front of anybody. We just I would go in there and I would be myself. I would use Bible stories that I learned it from like McGee and me. And like, <laughs> I am not. I am straight. Like, expectations. Yeah, bro. Like the Odyssey. Like oh I was like, I, like <laughs> I was just using things that, that stuff raised us. Man. That, yeah, I was using things that were stuck in my heart yeah. while at the same time. So, <laughs> right, he, they made him youth pastor and he, he has, I don't know, it's funny, he, he, all, and so what he's saying is he was made youth pastor and all he would do was share, uh, stories he heard as a kid, right? Um, right, because he hadn't studied the Bible up to this point. Well, newsflash, uh, Mike Todd, you still has it. Right, and so, um, <laughs> That, that 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 part was like, oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. You haven't studied the Bible, so therefore you aren't able to actually teach the children the Bible. You're just telling the stories and you're just sharing parts of your life. He's still doing that. You notice his theology has not ever matured since the youth program as a as a as a young young man. Very interesting. Claiming that the first night he went to youth group before he went in to teach them. God told him four things. He said four things. He said, I want you to be real. I want you to tell on yourself. I want you to love them first and don't judge them. Wow. So God tells him, you want, I, want to, I want you to be real. Uh, tell on yourself. There was something else he said. And don't judge them. See, this is how I know he's not reading the Bible. Because <laughs> he just told him something that wasn't true. If they are, the Bible says judgment begins in the house of the Lord. So I know God didn't tell you that. That's how I know you lie. Notice, notice what God didn't tell him to do. God didn't tell you to preach the gospel. Huh? God didn't tell you to preach his word. I, I, I mean, when, 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 when God would tell the prophets to tell them something, it was usually something in reference to, to God. Right. But Apparently, God is telling Mike Todd to tell to make a uh, anthropocentric message where the message is essentially about him and don't judge them. You know, everything the Bible says not to do. So just very interesting that God tells you to do something opposite of what the Bible tells you to do. 
Yeah, yeah. Hold on a second. I got you. I got you. Uh, hold on. Where, where, where is that? <laughs> I, so I, I got a new computer and my, uh, my sound effects are, uh, they're a little jumbled up. So I might have to get some more. <laughs> but yeah, like uh, I would say this. No, 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 no. God didn't tell you that, bro. But again, it always goes back to. Does someone believe what the Bible says? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got these Dr. Seuss books. I think I'm going to start a church, right? Because he says he's like, I was, you know, the Odyssey, right? He's reading the kids of the Odyssey, right? Like <laughs> trying to make some spiritual connection, <laughs> right? Some guy with one eye. See, you're using your one eye. You need to use both eyes. The Odyssey, right? Something about God's word, you know? <laughs> So in 2008, Mike Todd is running the soundboard for Gary and Debbie McIntosh at Greenwood Christian Center and leading a youth group that starts with only seven people, half of which he's related to. They named the group SoFly, and it stood for Sold Out Free Life Youth. It started on that first day, and it was called SoFly, and they named it Sold Out Free Life Youth. So fly, our mascot was a fly. That's good. It was great. <laughs> According to Mike Todd, for six and a half months, he just kept doing the same thing, saying that he was just telling the kids that there was a better life than the sinning that they were doing. And during this six and a half months, he says the youth group grew to 150 people. Now, Mike says that even at that point, he still wasn't studying to teach. He was just telling stories and altogether not taking it very seriously. He was going to the youth group every night, doing what he had always done before. And this goes on for over a year until the group grows to 200. So notice, Mike Todd is just giving them just moralistic stories about ah, stopping sinning, you know, or, you know, just doing, do better, right? Do better, right? And he sees that the church grows, the, or the youth group, sorry. The youth group starts to grow. You know, that's actually not surprising if you understand <laughs> kind of what we what we say all along. When you tell people, when when you when you're just telling people, hey, just to do better in their life, people don't mind people don't mind hearing that. Right? You're giving them no gospel. Right? You're giving them no gospel. Of course people will want to join that. That's what natural man want. They they don't want to hear the gospel. And remember, he's he's doing this for six months. He's not studying, not not doing any of these things. <laughs> this dude does no prep. Now we know more prep goes into the actual sound effects. You know, so so yeah. These students coming to SoFly. I'm sorry, now, the at props. the same time, Mike's parents still have less than a dozen adults attending their service. And at that same time, Mike is asked by Gary McIntosh to become the music director at Greenwood Christian Center because their music director had left and he needed to fill the position. So in 2008, Mike Todd is leading an enormous group called SoFly with 250 students and is asked to take the music director job at Greenwood Christian Center, a job that would come with responsibilities that Mike Todd didn't like, but he submitted to simply because he had the job. And that was staff meetings. And I've never been in a staff meeting in my life. I've never worked for anybody, a real job. So this is just kind of like, okay, I'm in a staff meeting. I'm sitting in the very back, like ducked off in the cut, waiting for this to be over every meeting. Now over the next two, two and a half years, Mike just keeps doing the exact same thing. Leading SoFly Youth Group, growing it and sustaining it, while at the same time, on staff at Greenwood Christian Center, being the music director and attending the staff meeting. Now, somewhere around this time, it is important to note that Mike Todd gets married to Natalie Todd on June 19th, 2010. This doesn't necessarily affect the theological underpinnings of Transformation Church, but it is a shift in Mike Todd's life that will affect things that come later, such as relationship goals. But we'll get to that in a moment. Now, at this time, Mike Todd says that he felt the Spirit tell him to bring the idea of merging the two churches together, something that he did discuss, but says that neither party was interested in. And so one day I felt like I should just say it. And I said, man, y'all came here 30 years ago to help Carlton Pearson build higher dimensions. Do, do you think y'all could come together to do this together? And they were like, nah, that, that'll never work. And I was like, okay. Three months later, the Spirit said, say it again. 
And I said it again, and they both were like, well, maybe. And they started talking to their oversight. Larry Stocksteel um, was Gary McIntosh's oversight, and the late Miles Monroe was my parents' oversight. And June 4th, 2011, the churches merged. And Spirit and Truth Praise and Worship Center merged with Greenwood Christian Center, forming what is now known as Transformation Church in June 2011. So these churches uh, merged together, right? Um, for whatever reason, well, I, 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 he doesn't share their reasoning, but they merged together to form one church, right? Um, just very interesting, very interesting, right? Due to uh, Mike Todd saying the spirit told him they need to do this, and I guess they listen. Very interesting. Now, this merger left Gary and Debbie McIntosh as the lead pastors, Tommy and Brenda Todd as the assistant pastors, and Mike Todd as the youth leader, now of a combined two. So this is an old video right here. <laughs> you see he's at the wheelchair. What's the, uh, what, where, where is the yeah, wheelchair? What, what is this called? He's got the props of that too, right? Just to help you out, the, the crutches, cane, some little medical device to help you walk, right? He's back then. This is probably pre 2015. He's he's doing that. Youth groups. The youth groups, Todd says, had 500 students at their first meeting of the joint churches. This many students seems to shock Mike into the realization that he needs to actually study and prepare for what he's speaking about. <laughs> so hold on, listen to this, y'all. <laughs> and that's when I was like, uh oh, <laughs> this may be for real. And so I started studying. He starts an internship program and a 12 person leadership team built off of that, while at the same time teaching high school and college students the importance of tithing so that he can fund the program and pay staff. Gary McIntosh sees that the church seems to have two completely different cultures. So is that this time where he's like finally realizing, oh man, I should start studying the Bible. <laughs> He's a youth pastor for years at this point. <laughs> He's finally coming to that realization. Oh, I should study my Bible. Yeah, I should start studying my Bible. Yeah, you know what? It was at this time he realized he didn't like studying the Bible. No, 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 no. You know, um, I, I, I don't see th these for these people. The Bible is just, man, it's a good guideline. It's helpful at some points, but it's really not the thing right we have this quote-unquote rhema word from god who needs the bible when you can hear directly from god what to do right i mean i know he preserved his word for thousands of you know for hundreds of years and you know i mean i know he said it was a more sure word but i'll go with the word of god right quote-unquote this audible voice from god what, what what were they doing did they vet michael todd did they say, hey, Mike Todd, um, what do you know about the gospel? Right. Did, did he get vetted at all during any of this? <laughs> they just let him get up. Hey, go up there. I mean, I, I got problems with most youth uh, ministries. I, my personal view is that we should all be one church. I mean, if they're actually Christians, what they should be. With the adults, the men. Yeah, I mean, the Bible says, let the old man teach the young man. Like, why can't it be? I, I don't see a youth pastor in the Bible, but I don't want to step on anybody's toes or anything. But obviously, regardless if you are a youth pastor or not, we would all agree that you should be st actually studying the Bible. I mean, my goodness. One, a student-driven one that Mike has from SoFly, an adult one that meets on Sunday mornings. And he wants to bring those two things together. But in order to do so, Gary has to give Mike more authority. And Mike becomes uh -oh. the executive pastor of Transformation Church, a role in which Mike oversees the day-to-day -day operations of the church, the ministry, and Gary preaches the main services. So he, Gary McIntosh, makes, he gives him a promotion. It gives uh, Mike Todd a promotion and Mike Todd becomes now the uh, not the youth pastor, but the executive pastor. And he has more uh, authority and power um, over. Over the say so and what the church can do and et cetera. So, right, because he's trying to bridge this gap. Right. Man, he's seeing the youth ministry is growing, but <laughs> the, the adults, you know, the, the main church got, you know, and it's not really growing as fast. So how can we get what Mike Todd sauce into the adult room sauce, right? 
That is until Gary has a heart attack and is out for eight months. For eight months, Mike Todd is thrown headfirst into leading the church, preaching the sermons, leading the small groups, and doing the daily duties that a pastor does until Gary is able to return. So, um, obviously, we don't make fun of this, um, that uh, Macintosh, he has a heart attack, right? And obviously, you have to actually recover, right? So, he's not allowed at this time to preach and do the daily duties of a pastor, Um and so, guess who steps in? Mike Todd. So check this out. I think this is a good place to note that Mike Todd has no official degree in biblical studies. But Mike does account this time as being his quote-unquote seminary in which he learned how to do the things that a pastor does. And so people ask me, did you go to seminary? Or I said, yep. For eight months, I preached four different messages every week to four different crowds of people. Wow. So on Sunday morning, I preached to this older, traditional group of people. On Sunday night, these unsaved, horny youth. And then on, on Wednesday night, I preached to the people who wanted to go deep in God. And then on Saturday, we had an internship, and I had to teach at that for eight months wow. every week. There you go. So he's – and, and by the way, I'm, I'm not arguing that someone is uh, – has to go to seminary, although it, obviously uh, it can be good and helpful. But the, my point is you um, you should be getting trained prior to you actually doing the job, right? Like, <laughs> I can't imagine. Yeah, it's almost, that's not actually seminary, like, <laughs> right? Everybody, act, like, you, you've done any job, right? Uh, hopefully, if it's done the right way, you're not actually doing... You don't start off on the job training. What do you do first? You're us- you're usually reading a lot of manuals. You're leading, you know, you're you're uh, and then you're observing, and then they give you little short jobs, right? Okay, let's see what you can do and handle, right? Um, but no one just throws you in and say that's training. That that would not be a good on the job training, and, but especially for a pastor, biblically, right? Biblically, we know that's not how it's to go, right? What about the qualifications? What about being taught? The Bible says that uh, you know, you know, you're supposed to teach. Uh, uh, the apostles' uh, tradition was that they would uh, teach men who are able to teach others, but none of that happened. I mean, self-admittedly. And that was the exact day I told my wife, I'm done with ministry. Now, we, if you recall, we've heard this story before, right? When people were coming against him about um, 
the Easter program, he retells this story as a kind of, well, my buddy Tim Ross is hanging with me despite all this backlash, right? <laughs> so we've heard this story before, and and so that's not a good thing. I don't know if you want the cussing pastor, stripper pastor, right, <laughs> to be the one affirming your ministry. <laughs> um, I mean, couldn't, couldn't um, you know, let's see, John Piper give you a call, like, hey, you got this, <laughs> you know. Uh, Steve Lawson, Vody Bauckham, couldn't some, like, Good men of God come to encourage, but God. To get some bread in my pocket, that bread in my pocket, some bread in my pocket, right? Not leaving the church, Mike. And Was gone. He lays so you know they approach him about like, hey man, we're not seeing no vision in this church, and that, and uh, right, th th that's a lot of like what you see all all the time, right? Like it's just the vision, just the vision, right, bro? This just the Bible, right? Just just preach the Bible. Um, but he approaches uh, Macintosh about that, and they're like, yeah, you're right. That's because you're supposed to be the pastor, and Mike Todd's a little hesitant about this, but. And, and his reason for why Mike Todd was supposed to be the pastor is, well, you've been preaching for eight months anyway. You might as well kind of be full time. I mean, you know, when we install a pastor, one things we tell. So I'll tell you how we guys do it. Right. When someone is a pastoral candidate, one thing that happens um, is we read over the pastoral qualifications and we pr present actual Then that person will be uh, given through, you know, some teaching series to see if they can teach. But most importantly, their life has to be in order. They have to be able to teach the Bible. If that's if that can't happen, then that then that they don't get to do the pastoral job before they're a candidate. What you see done here in, in Mike Todd's case is the cart. would do anyway. Gary, as some sort of reassurance, tells Mike that he will set up a long-term succession plan and that Mike will not take over the church until 2019. Mike likes this idea because it'll give him a chance to train and get ready. Things do not go as planned, however. 
And in September of 2014, during a random sermon, Gary announces to the church, unknown to Mike and Natalie beforehand, that at this time next year, in 2015, Mike would be the lead pastor of Transformation Church. So they agree to um, <laughs> like have a long-term plan to make Mike Todd the pastor, right? Like It was like a five-year plan. You know, long-term plan so Mike Todd can be the pastor. Well, it's like, I don't know if it was the next, I don't know if he said the next, but pretty soon he tell, I think it was the next Sunday that Mike, hey, God told, Mike Todd's going to be the pastor. And Mike Todd's probably in this audience like, I, yeah, I thought we agreed for a long-term plan. Well, he just threw it on him. Now, Gary and Mike apparently do not set up a definitive date that this transition is going to occur. But Mike does say that the Holy Spirit spoke to Gary on January 3rd, three days into their 21 days of fasting and praying, a word that would change everything. Three days into our 21 days of prayer and fasting in January 2015, the Holy Spirit told him, he said, if he's not the pastor February 1st, it's not going to be good. And he called me right out. Well, I would argue, <laughs> I would have argued the opposite. If Mike Todd is the pastor January 1st or February 1st, then it's not going to be good. And as we see, it is not good. Just look at the theology and the sermons coming out of Transformation Church. But notice, the Bible has no role until Mike Todd being a pastor. No, no, no ever conversation about the qualifications, et cetera, et cetera. But this voice of God we got. Again, by what standard should we reject Mormonism? According to this theology. If we just got to go with the voices we hear from God, quote unquote, right? Again, these guys do not actually value what the Bible says. The value is just the Bible is just a launch pad for these guys. Right. You ever seen this in preaching? Just start off with some verses to only do a TED talk for the next 30, 40 minutes to talk about the things they want to talk and it's largely disconnected from the Bible verse they just read. I have experienced that so many times with these guys. So I call them like TED Talk preachers, man. It has nothing to do with exegeting the Bible. These guys would actually wouldn't know what to do with the expositional sermon. If I said, hey, stay in the text the whole time. Stay in the Bible the whole time. I mean, <laughs> don't use your props. Preach like Jesus did. Preach like the apostles did. They, they, I don't know. I don't even know what to do. For me and Natalie's life, when, when we were handed that baton and, um, it was so crazy. Mike sees this as a fulfillment of what God had told Gary back in 1999 about reversing the curse. Mike recounts that the first Sunday before preaching, the Lord told him four things to set the vision for the congregation. And God told me, he said, you're not supposed to do it like this. He said, I want you to build a multi-church. And I said, okay, God. And he always tells me four things. Like, I don't know what this four thing is, but it's, it's right before I got up there, he said, I want you to say this the first day you become the pastor. He said, you're going to be a multi-ethnic church, a multi-generational church, a multi-campus church, and a multiplying church. And I want you to so multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-campus, multi, did I say generational? I thought he was going to say uh, multi-million, multi-million. Uh, but yeah, they actually passed the baton to Mike Todd, which is, which kind of gets you into their view of eldership. The pastor, the, 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 and most churches run like this. They function. And I, I, I think I want to do some videos on this. On the unbiblical view of many, and, and, and guys, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing the finger at Reformed churches too, where, you know, they ha may have multiple elders, right? They may have multiple elders, but let's be honest, it's on one guy. He's the main elder, right? There's no equal authority among the elders, even though biblically that's how a church is to function, Right? I mean, I, I think that is an unbiblical view of, of um, the church eldership. It is not the baton being passed to the one guy who's literally the head of the church to the other guy. 
There is no, the elders, they all have equal authority. But again, that, that might be another video for another day. Tell them on the first day that's what you're going to be. The reality is, though, the church was in a very rough spot in 2014 when Mike and Natalie went to speak to Gary and Debbie about leaving. Mike recounts that the entire first year he was pastor, he turned over almost all of his staff, either through people leaving the church, people having to be fired, or people moving on to other ministries. It was me and a business person. That's all Transformation Church was. One year into it. And God said, close your eyes and get the vision. Wow. Wow. And so that season was super hard. But notice it's God's always speaking to him. It's no direction from scripture. None, none no direction from scripture at all. But God's telling him, God tells him to close his eyes and, and imagine the vision. <laughs> Interesting. Hold on. I, I, I got something for that. I got something for that. Uh, hold on. Hold on. Mike Todd. We don't need our Bibles. Not as long as we have our imagination. <laughs> you don't need the Bible when you got imagination, right? Who needs the Bible? Right? Mike Todd? He says it's at this point that the Holy Spirit told him to close his eyes and, quote, get the vision. Mike says that during this time, he wanted to make it not about who was on the platform, but set a culture of worship. So instead of having professional musicians play the service, they would make YouTube playlists and use that for their worship on Sunday mornings. Around this same time, while Mike was seeking the vision that he says the Spirit had told him to do, he claims that the Spirit gave him a word for the year. Now this is a practice that Mike Todd has continued to do to this day. The word that Mike Todd received in 2016 that he was supposed to apply to 2017 was the word beyond. We always gather around a word for the year and God said, we're going to go beyond. Like this is our year to go beyond. At this point in 2016, Transformation Church had 500 people coming a week with a budget of $1.2 million operationally. Now during 2017, Following the idea of beyond, Mike claims that the church grew to 900 people and grew to a budget of over $1.6 million. Now, what may have attributed to some of this growth was the influx of people and money from a church plant called Eden Tulsa that joined together with Transformation Church. Eden now, we're going to see who comes out of Eden Church. Because when I saw this, I was like, oh, <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. This makes sense. This is how they met. Tulsa was being planted by Charles and Abby Metcalf. The Metcalfs were planning a new church in Tulsa and starting their small community group meetings March 5th. Does this guy look familiar? He is currently uh, one of the pastors uh, at Transformation Church. Currently, Charles Metcalf. Of 2017. They were planning to launch the church later that fall. Charles and Mike formed a relationship, and in August of 2017, Mike says the Spirit told him to take Charles on a trip with him to Dallas. I think I was on my way back from sabbatical, and I was like, B, I don't know what I'm going to preach when I come back. And you just like... You know, my wife was listening to me when um, she heard this, because he's like, oh man, I don't know what... I don't know what to, you, what to preach when I get back. You know, you don't have this problem when you just preach expositorily. You just preach verse by verse. <laughs> you just preach what you got. You just preach where you left off, right? For example, my churches, we're going through 1 John right now. Very good uh, sermons, by the way. Going through 1 John, you know? The only difficult part is what book you'll pre preach next, right? <laughs> uh, but what verse I'm going to preach next? Oh, that's easy. The next verse <laughs> or verse is, right? This is why I love expository preaching because it, it keeps the pastor from preaching his favorite uh, topics. Right. He doesn't get on his his uh, his soapbox every week. Right. He has to preach the whole counsel of God. You know, when you just do all these topical sermons, that's one of the dangers is a pastor just preaches what he likes, i.e. tithing becomes the main theme of the church. <laughs> you know, led by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I know it was now, but you flippantly said, like, you should do a series on relationships. Yeah. And I was kind of like, yeah. And 
From that, honestly, I didn't have anything else. Like, in my mind, there was no other thing. And she planted that seed. And the crazy thing that most people don't know is that she planted the seed about us doing a series on relationship goals. And then Charles was not a part of our church. Um, really? He was, no, he was planting, <laughs> he was planting a church and the Holy Spirit told me to take him on a trip with me. Yeah. And we went on a trip together and on that trip in Dallas, yeah. we went to a coffee shop and I was like, man, I got to start this series on Sunday <laughs> yeah. called Relationship Goals. Yeah. And me and Charles wrote our first sermon together. No. Do you remember this? Yeah, the first sermon we wrote together yeah. was before the person. Yeah. Really? Sitting at a cross. I got a picture of it. I'm like, like I'm. Yeah. We so Charles is to blame for the Relationship Goals sermon. One of the sermons, at least the initial one. <laughs> Charles, as, as we blame T uh, Tim for continuing Mike Todd's ministry, we can blame uh, Charles Metcalf for the relationship goal sermon. Very interesting. To put up the picture of it, and we wrote this sermon together. He was not a part of the church. It was on this trip, the Sunday before he was going to preach the relationship series, that they wrote the sermon that would eventually go viral. It was also during this time that they apparently planned on merging the churches together. So on September 24th, 2017, Charles announced to Eden Tulsa that they were joining Transformation Church. On October 10th, 2017, they posted about that merger with a video release talking about the merger on October 26th. Hey guys, Charles and Abby here. Uh, hope this video finds you doing well. We just want to take a second and share with you guys. Uh, you may or may not have heard, but God has been doing something so, so special in the life of Eden. And we are actually merging with Transformation Church here in Tulsa. And we are so, so excited about this. It's super, super special uh, because we truly realize that as the body of Christ, that we are truly better together. This weekend, we're actually celebrating that at Transformation Church at 9 o'clock and 11.15. You can join us there. We can't wait to see you, and we hope you come out and celebrate with us. Yeah, we love you guys, and we'll see you there. The day after this, Mike Todd releases a video about joining them for their first service together on October 29th. 2017 to be a part of a historic Sunday this Sunday as Eden Tulsa and Transformation Church become better together. That's right. We are merging and we did not even see how God was going to take us beyond this year, but he's blowing our minds and we want you to be a part of it. So you have two opportunities to celebrate with us. You want to be in this place because it's going to be crazy. I have a word from God that's going to help your everyday life. And I promise you, he has a word from God. But it ain't going to be in the Bible, right? <laughs> the praise is going up in this place on Sunday. I can't wait to see you there. I'm coming home. Now, it's not too long after the merger that Charles preaches his first sermon at the church on November 19th, 2017. Now, coming off a great year, Mike is anticipating that the word for 2018 is going to be something dramatic. It was beyond in 2017. What would the word be for 2018? However, he claims the Spirit gave him the word stride. And Mike was displeased with this word. And he said stride. S-T-R-I-D-E. Wow. I'm like, I don't even, I've never used that word. Like stride, like what is that? I had to literally look it up. And so for three months, I just acted like God missed it. Like. <laughs> so apparently God gives him the word stride. Mike Todd's like, I don't like it. And so for three months, Mike Todd was acting like God missed it. He, he, God got it wrong. <sighs> well, when you teach people God needs you, I, I, maybe, maybe that's a fair conclusion, but that's not what the Bible teaches. But imagine believing God got something wrong. <laughs> the omnipotent, sovereign king who created you got something wrong. Th that's just crazy. That is crazy. This wasn't the word he said, like. In fact, he says he didn't tell anybody on his team what the word was going to. Maybe God meant ride. You need to ride up on out of here because I didn't call you. I don't know. Maybe you, <laughs> maybe, you, I don't know. B, even though they kept asking. Mike claims that on Tuesday, December 5th of 2017, during a yearly church strategy meeting, which covers growth and finances and planning, his friend and oversight pastor, Tim Ross, stood up and spoke about how this type of growth wasn't sustainable. 
It was during these comments that Ross says that the church needed to learn to quote, strive. And this leads Mike and Tim to speak all night about how the church could stride and slow down in 2018. It was apparently this word from his friend, Tim Ross, that convinced him that the word he had heard from the Spirit was the right word. Well, they plan all night long and they come to the conclusion that while Jesus only had three years to fulfill his ministry, he never ran to his next appointment, but rather he had a stride about him and they needed to do the same thing. The term they continued to use was the pace of grace. And while this is something that Mike and Tim spoke about while strategically planning in 2018, it seems to be something that Mike was taught way back in his childhood by his mother. But the thing that you said earlier was... Guys, listen to all the new ageism that comes from this. Check this out. I'm just going to play it all. But listen, listen to how new agey this sounds. How you would do with, to set a mood right, right. back in the day. To this very day... It's nothing new under the sun. Right, okay. There are still, there is still music that is being uh, used mm. to set the mood the and the atmosphere of the day. Yeah. The same thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, with our son, Michael, who writes, produces, arranges, and preaches, all of that, preaches, he does it all. But see, when Michael was a little boy, um, we would often, I would often uh, take him in a certain room in the house and, and, and he plays drums just like mm -hmm. you used to play drum and then several other instruments and all of that. And I would teach him about atmospheres and how he could shift and change the atmosphere with drums. And to until a tweet went out on December 22nd, 2000. Now, um, let, let me respond to the New Age stuff because there's New Age people in here who've been influenced by New Age doctrines and et cetera. Um, but you don't have the ability to shift a room by merely walking into it. Unless you're going to preach the gospel and people get saved, right? You don't have see see the problem with this theology and, and Mike Todd's theology, they give man way too much credit. Right? This the little God stuff, man, is just floating around them. Right? They think they're a God themselves. Right? Um, no, you're not shifting any atmosphere. Unless with your with your own sinfulness, maybe. <laughs> uh, you know. But but yeah, that that is straight out of the new age playbook with the rhythms, vibrations, and 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 things like that. That is not the, a Christian doctrine. Um. 2017, of an individual he didn't know that didn't attend his church that shared a 10 minute clip of a relationship goal sermon he had preached a few months prior. Now, to be honest with you, I have searched and searched and searched for this tweet and I cannot find it. However, he claims that this clip was seen by 2 million people in 48 hours. In addition, he claims that it exploded their YouTube channel, and this sermon, as of now, has 10 million views. Now, Mike doesn't speak of what they ended up doing for the 2017 Christmas service, and we don't know either because that video isn't available on their YouTube channel. All we know is that the Sunday after Christmas, Mike preaches a sermon entitled, You Can't Stop Me.
popularity, so does Transformation Church. Mike Todd begins to become a guest speaker at a number of the largest churches in America during 2018, and he actually speaks at the very university that we mentioned at the beginning of this video, Oral Roberts University. Hey guys, do, do you guys remember, I, I made a short of it, and you probably have seen it from other places, where Mike Todd said that um, Jesus, Jesus didn't reach his potential. You guys remember that? I, I want to see some before I, uh, matter of fact, should I play it? Let's see if I can uh, find it here. I might play it for just in case you haven't seen it. Um, Cause I want to, um, Renee says that's when he started following him. Interesting. Let's see if I can find this for a second. I, I, I might play this for you. Just so you can see, <laughs> just in case you haven't, okay? Just in case you haven't seen this, I'm going to play this. I'm going to share my screen right here. I'm going to play this. Thoughts I want to end with, if it's okay. Jesus never reached his potential. Now, I know this is messed with a lot of people's theology. Because... Since I've been young, everybody's like, Mike, you need to reach your potential. Everything that God said and, and put in, inside of you, it needs to happen. But when I study the scriptures, he never reached his potential. When he... that sermon and i'm thinking about taking a sermon review if you guys would be interested i say that all to say that they only gave me a little time to preach so i'm about to go in hardcore okay so i want you to get out your bibles right now and i want you to turn to psalms chapter 1 verse 3. um at transformation church about a month ago we've been stuck in a series called planted not buried and um oh y'all heard it okay for everybody who doesn't and hasn't, um, I really feel that God told me to come here today to encourage somebody's faith. Um, because there's a lot of people in this room who are in situations and circumstances that it feels like you're buried. And I came to tell you that you're planted. And, and, and I came to let you know that there are certain things in your life that you have to walk through or you will not be ready for what God has for you. This success takes Transformation Church from one service each Sunday to five services each Sunday between 2018 and 2019. And in August 2019, Transformation Church, to accommodate the growth, buys the Spirit Bank in Tulsa, Oklahoma for $10.5 million. No, for real, don't play like that. Now, this is where I think it's important to zero in on one of the reasons people are so ride or die with Mike Todd, especially those that attend his church. See, when we talk about the Spirit Bank Event Center, there's something that we have to go all the way back to March 9th, 2015 to talk about. Mike claims that 37 days after becoming the pastor of Transformation Church, he was told by the Spirit to write down that, quote, the Spirit Bank Event Center will be Transformation Church. Um, we went from one service to five services in one year. And I was, they were about, they were trying to kill me. <laughs> and, um, and, and I was like, God, we got to do something. And 37 days after I became the lead pastor of Transformation Church, in my time of being quiet with the Lord, I was in my daughter Bella's room. She was just maybe a few months old. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, he said, write this down. I pulled my laptop up, and now I'm used to hearing this voice because I practice it from seventh grade. Mm. Mm. So I guess he's been hearing God audibly since seventh grade. So he's very familiar with this, even though he doubted it earlier. But that's, that's, um, that's another issue. A lot of people's like, I, I don't know if I hear God. It, it's familiarity. You'll start learning as you make the very time good. for it. Very good. And... Um, and, and so, so write this down, I pulled my laptop out, and the first thing I wrote down is, the Spirit Bank Event Center will be Transformation Church. 
37 days after being a pastor, we had no money in the bank, had 300 people literally voting every Sunday if they were going to come back the next Sunday. It was crazy, but God told me. And I think that did something to the story because a lot of times we're like, God told me something, God told me something. Mm. But it becomes a testimony when you mark the moment. Very good. And when I marked that moment, five years later, I was at a place where my faith was like, God, you got to do something that's going to prove that you're good, you're big, and you are not to be messed with. I don't want to stay at the starting line for, for 20 years talking about, I want to see your power. I want to, I, either this is real or it's not. Either, either you're going to be a big God or I'm about to do something else. And God was like, you testing me. So he's up there telling God what he's going to do, right? <laughs> you better do this or I'm going to do something else. <laughs> Very interesting. And, and, and what ended up happening is, when I was at the moment of my stress, God said, I already gave you the vision for what you need to do about the church. And I was like, I don't remember. I forgot that I wrote that down because it had taken so long. But I was learning in that time, the principle that is in the earth of seed, yep. time, and then harvest. And I forgot. And so of course he's preaching the uh, word of faith, the seed time harvest, right? Pretty much if you plant it, if you sow it, then it will, You'll get what you sow, right? Um, definitely taking uh, the sow and reaping of the Bible out of context. Out about it. I literally one night in prayer, um, God said, go back and check two hard drives ago. I go back and start checking vision. I just type in the word vision to my hard drives. This paper pops up from five years earlier. And God said, there it is. I said, this is it. I go to my team and my staff. I said, y'all, we're believing God for the Spirit Bank Event Center. We're going to do this. And this is when crazy faith came to me because I, I, I'm, I'm an extremist. Like, uh, I, I can't be like, we're just going to believe God in faith because that seemed weak at that moment because I knew this wasn't going to happen. If, if we just came with it at a mediocre kind of like, maybe if it happens, if it doesn't. And it just came out of me. I was like, we're going to believe God in crazy faith. And my crazy. team was like, Pastor. And something burst on the inside Come of me on. that day. And I went to the people and I said, find us out if this building is available. And these people came back and said, it's unavailable. I said, uh, before we get to that, I got a super chat. Let me uh, read this. I think it'll be helpful. Willie Doc, what's up, my man? He says, he said, appreciate you, K-Dub. How can we test if anything God says to Todd is true? Great question. And this is the question we should be asking. Great questions actually brings out uh, biblical truths, right? Uh, my position is, how can we know if anything God says to Todd is true? Examine it according to the word of God. You know, you know why? Yeah, I've heard it said, we haven't even mastered the Bible yet. And you think God is giving you some extra word? Guys, you know what? Maybe I will believe God is giving you some extra word when you actually uh, master scripture. Right. Okay. Hey, you get it fully mastered. Okay. Okay. Maybe I'll say, hey, maybe God will give you something else. Guys, nobody has actually mastered it. When I say mastered, I'm, you know, every verse, you know, every ex ex point, every context, every background, every historical point, every, there's no one I bring up to you. You're like, who is that? Right. <laughs> Some people sometimes about you're like, remind me where is that again? <laughs> Once you master all the scripture, maybe I'll be open to the idea. Um, um, that, that, that's the case. Right. But great question. God, I thought you said this was it. He said, you thought a closed door meant no. And so we started staying in faith with that thing. And I said, we're going to get this building. And there's like, it's not available next week. Hey, is anything happen? It's not available. Hey, building, it's not available. And to the point where I started getting discouraged. 
See, nobody talks about, they just want to shout on top of the building and say, I got the keys, the keys. But there was a time when I was about to quit, to quit, to quit. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. And, and when I was about to quit, we started looking at other buildings. And my team... Let, let me respond to this because uh, this gentleman is a... Uh, he believes scripture apparently is still being continued. Um, King Priest... Humble name, by the way. He states, did Abraham, Job, Moses, Hagar know the scriptures when God spoke to him? Here's the, here's, the, here's the obvious difference. Here's the obvious difference. They were living in a time where scripture was still being written. We are not. The canon is closed. So your, your, your comparison is apples and oranges. It doesn't actually fit. Right? So, of course, they were still getting scripture uh, revealed. We are not. Uh, unless you're arguing, we should add what Mike Todd says to the Bible. Should we? If you're saying no, then you're agreeing with me the canon is closed. If you're saying yes, then that's heretical on its own that we should add any, what anybody says uh, to, the, to the Bible, which the Bible says not to do. Right. Mr. Great King High Priest. One day came and they was like, well, we found this Kmart building that's that just shut down and all this other stuff. And I was like, all right, I'll go look at it. Be careful what you entertain when God's already given you a promise. We walk in that Kmart and there's poles all throughout the entire facility. And I knew what God showed me was something where we could do state of the art video and all this other stuff. And I said, this ain't it. No poles. I said, we're not settling for poles. So they started looking for other places. And this is what happened, Richie. We went to some other building that was nicer with no poles. And the realtor said, how's it going? And something rose up in me. I said, do you really want to know how I feel? And that man looked at me and said, sure. I said, this is what God promised me. I said, I don't want to see another building until this is available. I said, God told me. This is the building God promised me. And I was so... <laughs> I was so filled with faith and conviction that that man called those people every week until they were about to sell the building. At the closing table, I love God, with another company. <laughs> Ten minutes into the closing, the funding falls through. Oh. Because Bill called every week while in the closing room with somebody else, he picked up the phone, called our real estate person and said the funding just fell through. The building somehow is available. Are y'all still interested in it? What we thought was a setback was a setup. We didn't have the money when I first knew we were supposed to get it, but we were stacking them coins in preparation for the promise. We got that call on a Tuesday. We put down the earnest money on a Wednesday. The company was a big entertainment company and had deep pockets, came back with the funding on Friday, but they couldn't get it because God's child already had it. Now I tell you this story. Yeah, see what crazy faith can get you? <laughs> It can get you what you want. See, that's what this preaches to people. Guys, you don't have to be a Christian to like what he just said. You know how I'm, when I was an unbeliever, of course I wanted my stuff. Yeah, great question, Lawrence. Is it faith or covetousness? This is, this is the Oral Roberts theology that I was talking about in the beginning that is coming out of here. Right? Interesting. But yeah, again, you don't have to be a Christian to get people excited about all this. Unbelievers would jump up and down. Oh, that sounds like a great idea. I'll serve God. If I can get this, all it takes is crazy faith. Hmm, I'll take this. But notice what they're getting excited about. Very interesting, huh? Because it's one of many stories of why so many people are so ride or die with Mike Todd. When he tells them that God told him something and then that thing miraculously happens, it just solidifies the idea that Mike Todd is anointed by God and he is God's man. Oh, and by the way, I, I want to show something real quick. Let me show something. 
right? This was the prophecy, apparently, that God gave 37 days into Mike Todd's uh, preaching, right? Uh, <laughs> this is very shallow stuff. And when I say shallow, I mean, like, this is worldly stuff. Just look at some of the stuff. It's like, we will have a state-of-the-art facility. The kids zone will be a place that draws students from around the world. Somebody is going to underwrite this whole thing. We will always be in abundance. The internship will have a facility and be year around. Businesses will, will be started out of our church that are successful. We will have amazing relationships with all existing businesses and all other major businesses to come. We will subdue, rule, and dominate in that area. Many business people and their friends and family will come to Christ because we represent it. Oh, wait, represent it. Remember, for them, it's represent it. God to them for a transformation in Christ. Equipping the body of Christ will happen in this facility continually. It will be filled three times over every weekend. Major secular events will be held that will be held there that will pay abundantly for the expansion of the kingdom. It's very little to do with actual God, with, with God, right? With the God of the Bible. Um, very interesting. Very interesting. Um, and, and we know, yeah, they're re representing Christ to people is the unbiblical Christ. We, we got enough representing of Christ going around. We just need you to represent Christ. Teach the true Christ. Present Christ. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with the first presentation found in scripture. But we will continue. But, but yeah, yeah, that was the pro prophetic word God gave to him 37 days into his ministry, apparently. So when people like myself or others... Hey, look at me. Look, look. Hey, uh, shout out to the honest you pastor by putting me in this video, man. <laughs> I'm still in the same corner, man. Ain't nothing change. <laughs> nothing change. Point out his poor exegesis or his improper theology. They truly do not care because as far as they're concerned, God is behind Mike Todd and Transformation Church. Now the yeah, and, and that's the thing. Me and my wife, we went on a walk this morning. And that's what we're talking about, right? Like. Since Mike Todd, apparently, right, he, 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 he seems credible in this sense, right, that God told him a word and it happened, right, that someone like me comes along saying that's not God, it seems from an optic standpoint that I'm just a hater, right? Rather, my argument has been not against Mike Todd, but the theology of Mike Todd. I'm not making fun of how he dressed. I'm not making fun of X, Y, Z. My, my approach with Mike Todd and many of the people I address is doctrinal issues, right? I, I mean, hey, he got the Spirit Bank Center. Okay, I'm not mad at that. I mean, if he was making sound doctrine, how he got it, I would be excited about it. But I know how he got that building was on the backs of, 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 of people preaching false gospel, preaching a false doctrine, false message. So how can I be excited about that building? I'm not, I mean, I'm not mad in and of itself. I'm not mad because he has uh, nice clothes and a car. I'm not a very materialistic person. So I'm not just a hater, right? I don't like the theology because it is not what the Bible teaches. That has been my consistent argument, right? That is my consistent argument. The first service that was held in the arena was on February 10th, 2020 in which Mike Todd preached a sermon called History in the Manking. However, shortly after moving into the building in 2019 and right alongside of Mike Todd's Relationship Goals books being released in April 2020, the coronavirus hits the states. Now, what is seen by many as a setback, Transformation Church sees as an opportunity. Using the time to exclusively go online, perfecting their video presentations, remodeling the arena that they had just bought, and expanding their online reach. They take advantage of the reality that millions of people are glued to their phones and their computer screens. And aside And that's why I say Mike Todd is a brilliant marketer, right? He's brilliant at marketing, terrible at studying the word of God. From the release of his Relationship Goals book, he also releases another book based on a sermon series at this time called Crazy Faith. Now, what cannot be overlooked is during this time, Transformation Church gives out millions of dollars to different organizations in the community. In fact, they give back more money and affect more change in Tulsa, Oklahoma than any church that had come before them. And after COVID was over, 
and they had remodeled their arena that they had just bought, Transformation Church reopened with Homecoming Sunday. To be honest, it doesn't seem like there's really any stopping Transformation Church. With Mike Todd at the helm, they are skyrocketing in popularity as well as favor within the community and the world that they minister to. In fact, and and there's some truth in that. Um, it's my it's not my job to stop Mike Todd. I mean, I'm just one person. I, I can't stop anybody, right? <laughs> my my goal is to warn the true sheep in Transformation Church and to come out of bad doctrine, right? Yeah, generally, it is my experience that uh, people preaching falsehood and false doctrine don't repent, and there's no stopping them, right? But that's why my goal is to speak largely to um, the people in the church at Transformation Church to warn them and love. My, that is my motivation, love and concern for them. And so I, I, th I think there's some truth into that statement. It only seems like Transformation Church and Mike Todd will continue to grow in popularity. Nothing stands in their way. Everything that Carlton Pearson dreamed Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center would be is coming to fruition in Transformation Church. Though he had no direct hand in Transformation Church, it is undeniable that his influence lives on through Mike Todd today. In fact, there are some parallels that I think are worth seeing here and exploring. The fact that both men are dynamic leaders, able to gather large teams around them, both claiming to hear from God, setting forth a vision, and then propelling that vision forward, using their platform to promote relatively unknown upcoming pastors and speakers, and due to their popularity and charisma, both garnering success on both radio and television. Mike Todd, for example, was recently signed to TBN, the exact same network that helped Carlton Pearson spread his message back. So Mike Todd signed to TBN, so Trinity Broadcasting Network, network um, right? And so we're, we're <laughs> so much bad theology um, comes out of trans, uh, TBN, right? Let me respond to this comment because it's very unbiblical. <laughs> Since what's wild is one half of y'all don't have any resources to sow and change anyone's lives, yet you dissect him, SMH. It's very sad that you think uh, having millions of dollars is how you, how you change people's lives. I quote what the apostle says, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have, Jesus Christ, the gospel, I give to you. Notice you think the gospel is dependent, the sowing and change on someone's lives. I do not, which shows the difference in our theology. And there's no shame on me for, te for, teaching, um, for teaching what the Bible teaches. Shame on you for supporting false pa pastors. That's what's pathetic. That's what's sad is that you will, you, will, you will preach a false gospel. And to those who pointing out, you're more mad at. Nothing's changed since the biblical days. This happened in Jeremiah's day, Isaiah's day, Jesus' day, the apostles' day. People always wanted the smooth teachings. Preach to us smooth things. Preach to us what we like, right? Isn't that what Jeremiah 30 says? Preach to us, right, these things that won't offend. Tell us we'll get our money if we sow a seed. Lie to us, <laughs> right? Don't teach on sin and repentance. That's what natural man wants to hear. And guess what? Yeah, Mike Todd will give you all that. If you want a false gospel, if you want to, when you want all that, go to Mike Todd, sure. But if you want people who actually care for your soul, who don't want you to, who won't actually pander to you, right? We don't, we don't cast a net by preaching a false gospel. You're missing the larger point. I was just reading that today. You don't cast nets. The point is when Jesus cast, when Peter was casting nets, that, that is symbolic of true Christians, not false converts who just want their bellies filled. That just want the materialism, who just want word of faith heresy, who don't study their Bibles. I know, yeah, no wonder you're falling for this, and so many people fall for this. People become modeled after Mike Todd, who doesn't study his Bible, who and who hates to do it self admittedly. Who who hates to do it? See, this shows you actually don't understand the Bible. The the, the talents was not about money. I know that's Mike Todd's position. 
the money and the fish of the mouth. <laughs> it, it, you can tell, you can see what your idol is, Jessica. You love money. You love it. But I pray you will let go of that idolatry and love Christ more. Let's continue. In the 80s and 90s. As we've discussed in this video, we already know how Carlton Pearson's ministry ended in heresy. We, however, do not know how Mike Todd's will end. It cannot be denied that Mike Todd is a dynamic, engaging speaker. The real question is this. Will Mike use the gift that God has given him to declare the gospel to the ends of the earth, declaring that we can be reconciled to our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ? That Jesus that's, that's pretty much the end of the doctor. He had like 20 seconds left. But uh, very good, um, very good um, documentary done by Honest Youth Pastor. Right. Where he, he just goes into the history of Mike Todd from a very uh, neutral perspective for the most part. Um, I thought it was good. So anybody check that out Honest Youth Pastor. Check it out. I think we're supposed to do uh, something pretty soon. And so I think you guys would want to uh, enjoy that real quick. Uh, real quick. <laughs> yeah. And Peter said silver and gold I do not have. Um, again, if you have money, if you don't have it, serve God, serve God. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we, we know the goal for you guys is money minus Christ. So whether, uh, Hey, what Paul, what did Paul say? Whether I base or abound, I'll still trust God. We know for you guys, many of you guys, if you guys are broke, you're going to forsake the Lord <laughs> real quick because you're in it for the money. You're in it for the money. Notice, notice you can keep your mouth on us. Aren't we believers? So why don't you keep your mouth off us? You see that double standard there? So, oh, so, 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 she, so she's meaning her goal is money. Well, there you go. Well, there you go. Well, that says a lot about you, not me. Well, anyways, we will, we will uh, pray for Jessica that she be delivered from a false gospel. Um, and that she would grow to love Christ more than her riches, um, more than anything. You, Jessica, you have to ask yourself, why didn't your gospel give what the apostles, um, what, 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 what the apostles had, didn't have? The apostles were for, the apostles were poor. Read first Corinthians chapter four. Um, why weren't they rich according to you? Since God is going to bless everybody and everybody's going to be rich. If you come to Jesus for money, then he's not your money. He's not. Sorry. If you come to Jesus for money, then he's not your God. Money is <laughs> you. Your God is money, not Jesus. Your God is money. If you come to Jesus for anything other than Jesus, then you have a false God. You have an idol. God hates idolatry. And he will punish that if you don't repent. Oh, she says the apostles weren't poor. Let me let me let me prove her wrong first, right quick. This is this is the most <laughs> easiest thing to prove in the Bible. <sighs> Very easy to prove. Um, let me share my screen, and then I'll provide you guys with an update real quick. Um, yeah, yeah, right here. And this is in the context of, well, let's just read. It says, for I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death. Meaning they were very shamed. They weren't, they weren't in the high drubs of society. The apostles were looked down upon because we have become a spectacle to, to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sakes. And notice, I love the apostolic humor. We are fools for Christ's sake. But you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. Doesn't sound like they're rich. And we labor working with our hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slander, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. 
Now, I know this is disgusting to you. That's because you don't have a biblical view of the gospel, Jessica. Notice I proved the very thing you said was not in the Bible. Look, they were poor. They didn't have everything. Right? He said, you're not an apostle or a pastor or a preacher. What value does your words add to the body of Christ? Are you any of those things? I didn't know you had to be any of those things to preach what the Bible says. Notice when they can't address your doctrine, they have to attack you, the person. Right? Man, oh man. Let's pray for the loss. Some of these people would not serve God at all if, if they didn't think he would make him they would they would make him make them rich. Right? God doesn't owe you anything. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> Jessica claims she's an apostle. Well, that, that's how we know you're wrong. There was only 12 of them. <laughs> you're not the 13th apostle. Sorry to burst your bubble. Um, sorry to burst your bubble. But anyways, enough of Jessica's uh, false gospel. Uh, we will pray for her uh, that she um, experiences true conversion. One that is not filled with idolatry. Um, one that is not filled with love of God and, right? We come to Christ with an empty hand. But anyways, guys, I, I got some important news. To, guys, if you like the shirt, well, hold on, before this, before before that, uh, I am doing a, a, if you're in the Dallas area, if, I'm, if you're in the Dallas area, I am doing a conference or a concert. I'm doing a concert. And if you like to attend, the description is below. Uh, it is it is to raise fundraising for the adoption. As many of you know, me and my wife are adopting, and so we are raising funds not to fill our own pockets, right, but to uh, use resources to uh, do uh, do what's biblical: adopt adopt those who are uh, uh, discarded sometimes. Um, some mother's not able to uh to uh to help so so yeah 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 um if you would like to come uh the description is in the below to a link uh it's a facebook invitation so i would go and check that out i i appreciate it um hold on a second let me let me do something because jessica is losing her mind <laughs> enjoy yourself um but um but yeah come on come on come if you're in dallas come we would love to see i would love to fellowship with you guys uh if you can't make the concert can we just give yeah absolutely um you can give if if you go to the link there's links on the facebook page to give um <laughs> I, I I apologize, sister. <laughs> uh, I, I do apologize, but but if you are in the Dallas area, yeah yeah yeah. I I rare timeout from Kato. I I really don't be putting people in timeout, but it, what can you do when someone literally proves the verse to you, shows you, and you're still not willing to hear the word of God? Right. That's why I say the word of God is not the authority for many of these people. Right. Um. But man, if you're in the Dallas area, man, I would love to see you. I would love to fellowship. I think the con the concert's going to be great. There's going to be Christian rap. There's going to be hymns. Man, it's going to be a good time in the Lord. And also, you get to uh, donate to a special call, right? Adoption, right? You get to participate in the adoption. So when the baby comes, you can be like, the Lord used you, right? Right? Um. I'm not talking about tithing. When did I mention tithing? I freely give if you can. So <laughs> this is not even close. Not even close. You don't even know what a tithing is, apparently. Tithing isn't just giving money. I'm not, I didn't tell people, give 10%. Because if you don't, you rob God. And, you know, you rob. I didn't do any of that. Freely give if you can. Right? Anyways. Um <laughs> People cannot think in categories. But yeah, oh, uh, I see that Ike Moore says he appreciated the album. Cool, man. I appreciate it. 
Social Distortion, check out on Spotify. I'm, st- I'm still working on uh, iTunes. Uh, iTunes is down right now. Um, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's see. You said I titled the video. Of course I titled the video. You can't have a non-title on YouTube. <laughs> of course I did. Uh, let's see. What else? Oh, uh, yeah. If, if I know there have been people asking for shirts. <laughs> I know there have been people asking for shirts. Uh, KDubTrue.com. Get you an All Things Theology shirt. Um, check it out. So, yeah. Uh, man, this this is why we're, we're uh, Lord help me, man. It's a clickbait title. A look into his background and history. <laughs> that's that's it's literally the furthest thing from clickbait since that's literally what I was doing. <laughs> you don't know what clickbait is either. <laughs> How is it clickbait to say who is Mike Todd? A look into his background and history. When that's the very thing I did. <laughs> I can't believe you titled the video accurately. That's clickbait. <laughs> just preach the gospel, bro. You just preach the gospel. You're not even. Pre- you're, then, hey, all your comments need to be gospel. Don't complain about anything. <laughs> it's, it's a double standard. It happens all the time in the comments. They'll be like, they'll be like, Someone will comment on the page. Why didn't you just private message him? You're so hypocritical. You're, you're, you're evil. And I'm like, why didn't you private message me? <laughs> they're doing, th- they're demanding I do something that they themselves don't do. Right? Who cares about Mike Todd? Then don't watch the video. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> you don't have to be here. I mean, hold on a second. You know, um, this is what I say. If I make you feel some type of way. If you don't like the content or if look, this it's one thing for you to engage in a disagreement about the content. But if you're just mad that I'm just doing the content in general, I mean, I don't know what to say. I mean, <laughs> I do content that I believe is helpful. Um you know, again, if you if you want to disagree with a particular aspect, that that's totally fine. We can have a conversation. But this the fact that I'm making the video you're upset. I, <laughs> I, I don't know what to do. I mean, do your own video. Do your own video. OK, I mean. What's your take on the one one six click in Lecrae? Uh, I am not a. Uh, well, the 116 click is not around anymore. That's like an old, old deal. But Lecrae, uh, yeah, I'm not a fan of Lecrae's uh, theology, etc. Um, yeah. So. Uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, this, this is a good point. The guy comes in one video where I'm talking about a historical stuff right i'm talking about history of a particular modern day person he assumes i've never talked about jesus i literally just went out saturday open air preaching it's 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 funny it's funny when people just they watch one little video right and they'll make a whole characterization about your ministry why 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 you don't it's like yeah yeah interesting (laughs) my wife says we gotta go we're about to go watch a movie and so uh My thoughts on the uh, apocrypha. Say no to the apocrypha. <laughs> uh, well, when I say one one six broke up, I mean like that's one one six click is not around. It's not a thing anymore. It's I know they took yeah. So it's I never hear of one one six anymore. You made multiple videos about Mike Todd, and you made multiple comments about me. So now what? Uh, my wife shouldn't have told y'all what movie I, w- I want to watch because now people will tell me I'm compromised and <laughs> I'm going to see the Marvel movie. <laughs> so I'm saying he's preaching. A, he's watching a false gospel movie. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Uh... <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, man. Uh, I think next week, next week's live, I think I'm going to do a, a video on the difference between Lordship Salvation and Free Grace Theology. Cream says, you sound mad. Nah, I'm good, bro. Um, appreciate you, man. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm going to do a difference with I'm going to do a theology on a video on the difference. I had someone in my church like hit me up and I was like, "What's the difference between lordship salvation and free grace?" And I was like, "You know what? I'll do a theology about it. I'll do a, I'll do a video about it." So, um, if you guys would be interested, make sure you. Um, check out next week's live we'll be talking about uh free grace versus lordship and so um yeah i'm excited for that uh, we'll be able to dive into many scriptures <laughs> someone will still complain but that's okay um it'll be all right i enjoy making content still but again if you're in the dallas area check the description below come to the concert um even if hey if you can't give anything we'll still let you we'll still let you come in as long as you've been praying for us so <laughs> if you've been praying you can come into the concert for free but obviously we would like uh to give resources to give to the adoption but we're not in it just for money but um yeah neilan lordship salvation is so understood understood so i hope to bring some clarity to the subject because I'll get into it. I'll get into it uh, next time. I'll get I'll get next week, Lord willing. Um, Kareem says, sounds great. So edifying. Well, this was edifying, too. <laughs> I know people want to act like false teachers are in the Bible, but it's in 26 out of 27 New Testament books. But you can't just ignore it. Right. But yeah. Yeah. My brother's in the building. He's going to be at the concert, man. So y'all want to come, man. It's going to be a good time. Check out the album, Social Distortion. If you haven't uh, listened to it, would love to know your thoughts. Get a shirt, kdubtrue.com. Uh, yeah, so much going on. But at this time, man, I got to go. My wife is calling me. I could, She's like, we got to get there early to movie. We're going to one of those fancy uh, movies or it's an eatery as well. So, you know, I might get me some, uh, you know, I might get me a hot dog, uh, you know, steak. I don't know. You know, we got to see. Y'all know I'm a big foodie, right? Uh, <laughs> I love to eat and to fellowship. Um, so I thank you guys for watching. Till the next time, grace and peace. Grace and peace, y'all. Hey, till the next time, y'all. Grace and peace.